Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 586, 9. Ultraman Lotto Gyro, his life rapidly slipping away, fell into a daze. Even his thoughts of self-preservation became blurred. In the haze, he vaguely saw Juan Oro, the wrinkled old man, standing in the middle of the sea, waving with a mix of joy and mockery. At that moment, Lumian's voice resonated from the horizon, faint, ethereal, and elusive. Did you go to Cordu Village to confirm the situation? Cordu Village? The time mad lady and I visited Nolfi and went there just out of convenience. Lotto Gyro lost focus and Lumian's figure reflected in his closed eye. With the intent to annoy, he spoke his last words in Highlander. I've been there with Mad Lady. It was simply for fun, but Loki seemed to have ulterior. Don't you want to know what happened back then? Sure, I'll speak in Highlander. It's your problem if you don't understand. Your fault for not taking this language seriously in the past. Lotto Gyro knew his actions wouldn't practically affect Lumian Lee. This was because Lumian Lee could find someone to perform dream divination, hypnosis, or undergo a real dream when he returned. From there, he could memorize the Highlander he spoke and find a way to translate it into Intision or Ancient Faceac. Still, he just wanted to annoy the other party. About to die, he couldn't care less about future developments. Motives, Lotto Gyro uttered his last word as his life extinguished. In that final moment, he seemed to hear Lumian Lee speaking to him in Highlander, thank you. The thank you flowed naturally, carrying a strong sense of mockery. Ultraman Lotto Gyro's intact eye bulged even more, his expression freezing on his face, his breath coming to a complete halt. Lumian's right hand gripped the symphony of hatred once more. Simultaneously, he released his left hand, watching Ultraman's key member's head rapidly detach from the black bone flute with red holes, revealing a sinister and deep blood red hole. Thud! Ultraman collapsed to the ground. The sticky blood on the black bone flute coalesced and dripped onto his body. After the person who had backstabbed it suffered a fatal wound, Pride Armor stopped moving and stood nearby, resembling an ordinary silver-white full-body armor without any special characteristics. Loki had ulterior motives, a motive other than helping the sinners and pulling a prank. As Lumian recalled Ultraman's confession before his death, he bent down to check what items this April Fool's key member had. Of course, he didn't hold much hope. Ultraman Lotto Gyro had disguised himself as the incoming governor of the sea, Simon Gyro, to board the betrothal ship. Carrying no items, his belongings should have been handed over to Mad Lady, allowing her to conceal them using flesh and blood magic in his stomach. However, Mad Lady clearly didn't have the time or opportunity to return the items to Ultraman. This was one of the reasons why Lumian could eliminate Ultraman, a powerful dual pathway Bayonder, in such a short period. If Juan Oro hadn't tipped off the sea spawn on the bridal boat beforehand, Lumian would have been forced to stash his traveler's bag temporarily with Mr. K. At that moment, Lumian observed a strange transformation in the corpse of Ultraman Lado Gyro. It swiftly faded, morphing into a semi-translucent, semi-flesh state. Then, like it was being disintegrated by countless tiny creatures, it oozed into the silver metal floor and gradually vanished. Soon, the remnants of flesh, starlight, and sun-like fragments left by Lotto Gyro were absorbed by the silver metallic floor, leaving behind only a sea governor ceremonial robe shrouded in a faint grayish-white fog. In the blink of an eye, the grayish-white fog got absorbed by the silver metallic floor and the mysterious structure. Lumian attempted unsuccessfully to reclaim something. Is this what it means to return to the sea? But why did this peculiar structure absorb the Priest of Light's Bayonder characteristic? Just as Lumian pondered, the sound of metal grinding surrounded him. The pitch black holes in the surrounding walls, ceiling and floor once again got concealed by rotating, protruding metal. No more cerulean blue poisonous gas spewed out saving Lumian the energy to engulf his body in a layer of crimson, almost white flames. Amidst the clanking sounds, two metallic doors ascended, revealing two tunnels leading to different destinations. With the target of the betrayal now gone, 
the silver-gray behemoth reverted to its normal state. Mumian peered into the depths of the tunnel ahead, his heart involuntarily racing. Badump, badump, he felt inexplicably nervous and uneasy. In Port Santa, the apartment Loki was hiding. The moment Ludwig declared, I'm hungry, he swiftly bowed his head and sank his teeth into Loki's hand, gripping the gemstone bracelet as if devouring the marrow from a chicken wing. An intense wave of pain surged through Loki's mind. His immediate instinct was to deploy paper figurine substitutes, a desperate attempt to break free from the current situation. Yet he hesitated, fearing that such a move might create an insurmountable distance between him and the sealed demigod, eliminating any chance of regaining control. Amidst the gruesome symphony of bones crunching and flesh tearing, Loki snatched the falling gemstone bracelet with his free hand and forcibly pried open his mouth. Bang! A rush of air slammed into Ludwig's head, akin to a bullet fired from the latest steam rifle, ripping through flesh and hair to reveal a ghastly white skull. However, Ludwig remained unfazed. Gnawing on Loki's left hand, he had already severed five fingers and devoured half of the palm. Bang, bang, bang. Air bullets relentlessly pounded the boy, leaving him mangled and disfigured. Yet, Ludwig persisted in his attentive nibbling on Loki. Crack, crack. He had already crunched down on the other party's wrist bone, a crisp sound echoing through their intertwined flesh. As Loki nearly blacked out from the pain, he roughly grasped what was happening. The sealed demigod possessed incredible vitality. Ordinary attacks and Bayonder powers couldn't cause significant harm. In simpler terms, he could put him to sleep or manipulate his spirit body threads to knock him out, but killing him with regular means proved challenging. It couldn't even seriously injure him. In such circumstances, even if the sealed demigod couldn't utilize any abilities, lacking sufficient strength and speed, merely devouring the other party's flesh and bones with all his might posed an abnormal challenge for many mid-sequence Bayonders. Loki abandoned the idea of retrieving other mystical items and substituted himself with a paper figurine. Swoosh, 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 Ludwig, his head covered in signs of air bullet destruction and almost devoid of human form, raised his head. Beside his blood-stained mouth was a piece of white paper that quickly swept into his mouth alongside the blood-colored flesh. Ludwig's eyes reflected Loki's outline in the corner of the room. Something beneath his torn skin and flesh seemed to squirm slowly, attempting to break free, but to no avail. Loki assessed the situation and the items on him. With the sole assure marionette unable to return in time, he sensibly chose not to confront the sealed demigod creature. He would flee first before considering the future. At that moment, a crimson moonlight streamed through the window. The moonlight bathed the apartment, wrapping around Loki. Loki heard a fleeting voice, a strong smell of blood. As the moonlight faded, a grayish-white and pitch-black paper figurine appeared on the ground. Loki's figure materialized a few hundred meters away, outside a vine forest. It was a boon bestowed by the Celestial Worthy during a prayer some weeks before this operation. It had been attached to a pre-prepared paper figurine, forming such a potent substitute that bordered on godhood. Drip, drip. Blood still dripped from Loki's bitten left wrist. He activated the diamond on the bracelet and swiftly faded away, preparing to teleport. Port Santa, Milo Village. Tap, tap, tap. The soft patter of footsteps reverberated in Bard's ears, causing him to tense. Bard surveyed his surroundings, finding nothing amiss. He sprinted, weaving through several buildings, yet the rhythmic tapping of footsteps persisted behind him. Attempting to force open a door and seek refuge in a villager's house in Milo Village, Bard was met with an unexpected sight. Instead of the familiar kitchen, tables, chairs, and household items, his eyes beheld a decrepit stone platform enveloped in darkness. The stone platform, Bard's pupils widened as if he had entered an unreal illusion. He found himself back at the residence of the Governor of the Sea and the altar where Milo Village's inhabitants paid homage to their ancestor. Something crawled out from a crack in the worn stone platform. 
A translucent worm, adorned with multiple rings, swiftly expanded, transforming into a young man donned in the attire of a sea prayer ritual's deputy host, monocle in place. Seated on the weathered stone platform, the man grinned at Bard. Do you comprehend? Bard suddenly grasped the meaning behind the question. Swallowing hard, he replied, understood. Since the altar had an owner and Bayonder creatures residing there, the so-called rule that it could only be enchanted once a year for the Ring of the Sea Queen clearly didn't hold true. The other party could affix the power as many times as desired. The young man, clad in a dark blue deputy host's sacrificial robe, toyed with the monocle in his right eye and smirked. Over a millennium, I've molded the rule that the steel ability can only be conferred once a year. Little did I expect to deceive you all in the end. Chapter 587 Deceived Upon hearing the young man's words, Bard felt his blood rush to his head. Crafting a seemingly valid rule over a millennium to deceive others. What kind of lame antique swindler is this? Bard blurted out. The patterns on the altar and the surrounding arrangements are also fake? The young man in the dark blue deputy host robe chuckled. If it wasn't real, would you have been deceived? Furthermore, I occasionally venture out. When I do, it grants steel powers on my behalf. Of course, with the spirituality produced by the surrounding worshippers, it can indeed only bestow once a year. As the young man spoke, the smile on his face widened. Bard's forehead throbbed as he listened, feeling like he had been mocked. According to the other party's claim that the steel powers could be bestowed at will, the Ring of the Sea Queen should have been complete and equipped with all its functions. So, why did the success of the Sea Prayer ritual experience such a significant delay? Unable to comprehend the situation, Bard turned around and sprinted towards the exit. It wasn't that he hadn't considered begging for mercy and surrendering on the spot, but these things could be done later. For now, he wanted to take a gamble, betting that the other party's claim of occasionally venturing out was a lie. In essence, he believed he was trapped in the altar, unable to venture anywhere and influence the people around him. If he allowed himself to be intimidated and didn't dare to escape, he would fall into the other party's trap, cheated of his freedom and future. Thud, 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 Bard reached the staircase in a few steps and ran up. The more he ran, the happier he became. The monocle-wearing young man didn't stop him. I made the right bet. He's the core of that altar. There's no way to leave. Thud, thud, thud. Bard witnessed the scene on the first floor illuminated by sunlight. Amidst his ecstasy, his thoughts suddenly shattered. He felt the darkness around him being pierced by the light, shattering into pieces. Bard bolted upright, alarmed to find himself lying in the servant's room at the governor of the sea's residence. He hadn't left. He surveyed his surroundings and heard cheers and crackers from outside. I just had a dream? Did it stem from a spirituality warning, helping me discover a problem with the plan? As Bard pondered these thoughts, he immediately dismissed the corresponding judgment. No, how could I have fallen asleep during the sea prayer ritual? Did I start dreaming after hearing soft footsteps in my room? Bard rolled to his feet, slung his backpack over his shoulders, and tentatively pushed open the door, entering the corridor. No longer smug with the plan that required minimal risks or combat, Bard realized he couldn't share in the distribution of items. He couldn't teleport away directly, nor could he return to his original appearance or disguise himself as someone else. Upon reaching the corridor, Bard noticed the little devils leaving the shadows and performing a strange celebratory dance. He hadn't communicated with these sea spawn and knew their intelligence was roughly equivalent to that of ordinary dogs. They could be tamed and controlled, but direct communication was beyond them. However, the amazing thing was that little devils had the ability to record and recreate human words, even if they weren't sure of their meanings. Moreover, they could receive signals from their collaborators within a 100-meter radius. The little devils ignored Bard as well. The sea prayer ritual had succeeded. According to their prior agreement, the fake governor of the sea could leave on his own. Bard left the governor of the sea's residence and realized that the guards at the entrance weren't kneeling to thank the boon like before. 
The villagers of Milo village at the docks were the same. Apart from a few who sincerely shouted that the sea prayer ritual had succeeded, the rest merely echoed what was happening and expressed their joy, with many preferring to release crackers. Indeed, it was a dream. The villagers' reactions in the dream were too exaggerated. I should know that based on past experiences with sea prayer rituals, only the committee members of the fisheries guild and a few people with strong sea bloodlines can sense the arrival of the sea's boon. Others with sea bloodlines wouldn't have a tangible sense. They'd slowly realize they've become stronger, or the changes are too weak to detect. Otherwise, the failure of the sea prayer ritual last year wouldn't have escaped the notice of Port Santa's citizens and would have only circulated within the core circle. Bard used the environment to quickly confirm the essence of his previous encounter. He didn't dare relax, nor did he again head to the docks to admire the villagers being fooled. Instead, he turned to the road leading to Port Santa's city district. Just as he stepped out of the ancient village, Bard spotted a figure ahead. The man stood over two four meters tall, clad in a simple linen robe and a hood, holding a thick staff. Gandalf, Bard's heart tightened as he shouted. With the dream just now, he thought he had been exposed, so he didn't pull off any act. Gandalf, the president of the curly-haired baboons research society, was taken aback and let out a deep chuckle. You're really fake. H. He's not sure of my identity? Bard was taken aback, wishing he could slap himself. Inside the underwater spaceship, in a metallic room reminiscent of a beehive. Having failed to capture Mad Lady twice in a row, Mr. K's body underwent a sudden transformation, expanding to nearly three meters in height. Fortunately, he wasn't adorned in actual clothes. The blood-colored cloak draped over him had morphed from his flesh and blood. Otherwise, even the loose robe would have succumbed to the drastic change. Concurrently, Mr. Kernke's skin darkened, assuming the appearance of thick and formidable armor. Crooked goat horns adorned with sinister patterns sprouted from his head, and a pair of bat-like wings, encircled in crimson and blue flames, emerged from his back. A pungent smell of sulfur hung in the air. Being a Sequence 5 shepherd of the Secret's suppliant pathway, Mr. K possessed the core ability of grazing. This allowed him to fuse other people's souls with Bayonder characteristics or boon powers and utilize them uniquely. It was akin to grazing lambs for a deity. Each shepherd could graze up to seven souls, controlling only one at a time. In this state, shepherds could employ their Bayonder abilities and three abilities corresponding to the souls. These were chosen during grazing and remained fixed thereafter. The most formidable aspect of shepherds was their ability to graze demigod. Level spirits, enabling them to contend with saints for a limited duration. Presently, Mr. K was using a grazed devil. He had selected devil transformation, sulfur fireball, and sword of lava in the past. Mr. Kanuke deliberately chose to forego devil's most distinctive danger premonition because he believed it to be effective only when commanding the devil's spirit. Under normal circumstances, he couldn't activate grazing continuously. In any case, if grave danger loomed, a divine revelation would be provided by God. Failure to receive such guidance indicated wrongdoing, warranting divine punishment. As the expansive bat wings on Mr. K's back unfolded, light blue fireballs condensed, numbering almost twenty. They indiscriminately bombarded every corner of the metallic beehive, creating an all-encompassing barrage to counter Mad Lady's elusive flashes throughout the space. Rumble. The explosion, a mix of fire and poison, wreaked havoc on the metallic hive, tearing apart the incubating baiting's black insect, little devils, and other creatures. Mad Lady abruptly halted as the sulfur fireball condensed. Cloaked in a blood-colored dress with grotesque flesh lumps on her face, an illusory, slowly flipping book materialized in her eyes. Faint recitations echoed around her. Drawing a dagger, she genuflected and drove it into the metal floor of the hive. Dawn-like light ascended, forming an almost invisible wall around her. Rumble, the shockwaves from the sulfur fireball's explosion and the poisonous pail. Blue fireball relentlessly struck the invisible barrier, causing it to sway, yet it stood resilient. 
This was protection of a warrior sequence 5. Record, the core ability of a sequence 6 scribe of the apprentice pathway allowed the recording of others' abilities for use, each recording usable only once. Scribes could even record Bayonder powers with godhood effects, but the success rate was minimal. After the explosions aftershocks subsided, Mr. Karen K, donned in a blood-colored cloak and resembling a colossal devil, wielded a broadsword composed of crimson lava and pale blue flames. He surged towards Mad Lady in two steps, slashing down. The nearly invisible wall around Mad Lady couldn't withstand the onslaught and finally shattered. As the illusory book in her eyes flipped, a robust and sharp Sword of Dawn materialized in her hand. Excitedly, she swung her two-handed light sword. Clang! Mr. K's strike sent Mad Lady, lacking a warrior's physique and strength, flying. Though Mr. Kanin K hadn't anticipated her determination to engage in close combat despite her limitations, the battle's tempo remained unaffected. He advanced, wielding the lava broadsword once again. Poof! The mad lady he struck suddenly thinned, transforming into a paper figurine consumed by sulfurous flames. Paper figurine substitutes, mad lady reappeared beside a demolished metal hive, her illusory book flipping once more. She then stretched her arms, allowing a pure and magnificent blazing pillar of light to descend from the sky and strike Mr. Kenan K, who had attacked the paper effigy. Priest of Light's Light of Holiness, Chapter 588, Degree of Madness. Mr. Kee K shifted instantaneously, tapping into the Grey's Traveler's soul. His eyes took on an otherworldly glow, as if concealing doors to different realms. His form faded, and in an instant, a luminous white column surrounded by flames emerged, shrouding him within its fiery embrace. In the ensuing moment Mr. Kreke, stripped of his devil guise, materialized in a corner of the metallic beehive, his form liquefied, his flesh resembling dripping candle wax. The secret suppliant pathway symbolized corruption, its influence curtailed by the sun pathway's capabilities. Half-melted flesh and blood cascaded onto the metal floor, seeping into it in a bizarre manner. Soon it was absorbed by the spaceship Mad Lady had earlier detailed. Even Mr. Green K felt the weight of an unseen force, as if an invisible hand pressed him down. His attempts to extricate himself from the metallic floor proved futile, and he continued sinking gradually. Mad Lady, with grayish-green eyes gleaming, teleported near Mr. Despite his blood-colored wax-drenched visage, Mr. K faced Mad Lady without a trace of fear. His focus remained fixed on the evil god's aura emanating from the metal hive, his ultimate target. He switched the grazed soul to an arbiter pathway beyonder, with two bolts of lightning gathering in the depths of his darkened eyes. Psychic piercing. Mad Lady refrained from teleporting. The illusory book within her eyes flipped open, revealing the kaleidoscope of colors on Mr. Kaake's body and the shifting hues of light during his grazed soul transitions. Excitement illuminated Mad Lady's face. Raising her right hand, she prepared to delicately twist it clockwise. Steel, this was an ability she had recorded from Bard. A sudden, intriguing notion captivated Mad Lady's thoughts she yearned to witness the aftermath of stealing the grazing ability from a shepherd. It was crucial to understand that her steal ability was limited to just one from a target, devoid of any connections to the abilities that came with it. In essence, after snatching the grazing ability, the soul, characteristics, and powers under grazing's influence would persist within Mr. Kersenke's body. In this state, Mad Lady pondered whether shepherds would grapple with internal conflicts, the fusion of characteristics, or a loss of control akin to the switching between non-adjacent pathways. Excitement bubbled within Mad Lady as she deliberately blinked near Mr. Kino K, compelling him to switch grazed souls. She observed keenly, eager to discern which light aligned with grazing. As for Mr. K's reaction, she cared little. You continue your fight, I continue my steel. Whoever dies first loses. Simultaneously, the metal floor, saturated with Mr. Kanye K's flesh, quivered unexpectedly. A previously concealed door within the metal hive withdrew, unveiling a passageway that hinted at a silver metallic hall beyond. 
a formidable suction force emanated from that direction. While her attempt to steal Mr. K's grazing ability was underway, Mad Lady lacking the strength was propelled into the air. Dark blonde hair whipped around wildly as she soared toward the origin of the anomaly. Meanwhile, Mr. Kenny K remained locked to the metal floor. Though his body swayed precariously on the verge of being pulled away, he held his ground, unsteady yet resilient. The face of the blood-colored wax-streaked Aurora Order Oracle betrayed an anxious expression. The enemy was on the verge of escape. The source of the evil god corruption had revealed itself. Mr. King Ake swiftly switched back to the corresponding devil spirit, summoning a broadsword forged from crimson lava and pale blue flames. Targeting his body adhered to the metal floor, he executed a slashing motion. Beneath his calf, flesh promptly separated from his main body, the incision undergoing a mesmerizing melding of half-melting and half-reforming. Having relinquished a portion of his flesh, Mr. Kesike allowed pale white, moist and freshly formed limbs to squirm out from the severed stump. Concurrently, he harnessed the formidable suction force to pursue Mad Lady and draw closer to the source of corruption. In midair, he witnessed Lumion disguised, clutching the doorframe in a struggle against the menacing suction. He observed the motionless silver, white full body armor seamlessly blending with the floor. Mad Lady surged ahead on the verge of flying past Lumion. With a wave of her right hand, she emitted a greeting like, Hello, her face radiating excitement and anticipation. Lumion's pupils constricted. Disregarding his precarious state, he harumphed. Two beams of white light shot forth from his nostrils, accurately aimed at Mad Lady but influenced by the tangible and enigmatic suction force. They bent and plunged deeper into the tunnel. At that moment, Lumian's grip on the silver metal door frame neared its breaking point, blood seeping from the strain. Faintly, he sensed an abundance of flesh and skin deep within the tunnel, intertwining to shape a colossal structure resembling a pear-shaped bird's nest. Suspended in midair fleshy ropes as thick as two or three adult arms and covered in a translucent membrane, extended, linking the distant wall, the ceiling above, and the metal on the ground. Within these flesh and blood tendrils, specks of starlight and a mysterious dark substance flowed into the massive pear-shaped object. The bird's nest-like structure was contracting inward, its various parts deeply sunken, delineating lines that hinted at a substantial disk. The terrifying suction force, capable of manipulating both reality and mystery, emanated from this pear-shaped object composed of skin, flesh, and blood. At that moment, the outlines on the pear-shaped object quivered, and all the indentations bulged and expanded. With this transformation, fragments of starlight spilled from the fleshy bird's nest, rushing into every cabin within the spaceship. This event resembled the prior two releases of the sea's power, yet lacked the grandeur and vastness, lacking the potential to rend apart anyone obstructing its path. Lumion could already envision the repetitive expulsion, understanding that the silver-gray behemoth had amassed a power capable of threatening the seal. Year after year, it required the extraction of this accumulated pressure. As the abundance of starlight scattered, the formidable suction force dissipated. With two thuds, Mad Lady and Mr. Kanenike collided with the ground. One found herself in the tunnel leading to the fleshy bird's nest, while the other lay in the silver hall where Lumion and Ultraman had previously battled. Lumion released his grip, landing on the ground. His gaze swiftly fixated on the April Fool's key member, adorned with clumps of flesh and blood on her face. Mad Lady sprang up, exclaiming to him and Mr. Peel, K, okay, did you see that? Did you see that? That's an incubating deity. Yes, it should be a deity. Despite the intense fluctuations in Mad Lady's emotions, Mr. K discerned no sincerity in her tone. Her mention of deity sounded more like powerful and terrifying monster, a mere description. In the next instant, Lumion materialized behind Mad Lady, who promptly vanished on the spot, blinking closer to where the starlight had scattered. Lumion, sensing danger instinctively, felt his heart quicken involuntarily. 
he hesitated to delve too deeply into the tunnel, avoiding proximity to the flesh and blood bird's nest he had vaguely seen before. Unimaginable horrors were certain to unfold. However, Mad Lady sprinted in that direction. Let her venture deeper and potentially meet her end. Lumian's thoughts raced, torn between decisions. Another second passed, and Mr. K&K teleported in front of Lumian, fervently pursuing Mad Lady. In that moment, Lumian, who had often considered himself a bit eccentric, found himself yearning for a bit more normalcy from the duo ahead of him. While he could comprehend Mr. K's choices and actions rooted in unwavering faith in God and the pursuit of divine will, coupled with a hint of extremism Mad Lady's conduct exceeded his expectations. Drawing from I know someone's confession and Mad Lady's previous behavior, Lumian detected no signs of her fanatical devotion to the Celestial Worthy. Simultaneously, due to the ongoing conflict between the Celestial Worthy and Mr. Ponal Fool, she couldn't always rely on protection. This raised a question for Lumian. If Mad Lady consistently courted danger, how had she managed to survive to this day? April Fools lacked the strict hierarchy and coordination seen in the Aurora Order. Most of the time, members operated independently with minimal interaction. Protecting Mad Lady from the start, allowing her to grow steadily with such a mindset, seemed implausible. Could it be that I know someone had once overseen the treatment of Mad Lady's mental and psychological issues? After his demise, did Mad Lady's problems exacerbate? Lumian quickly formulated a plausible explanation, but considering Mad Lady's conduct on the betrothal ship, her current state struck him as abnormal. On the betrothal ship, faced with the impending release of the sea's power in the energy passageway, Mad Lady, though eager and seeking excitement, had an escape route. As long as she didn't delay until the last moment, she could teleport away, avoiding the actual risk of death. Now, whatever lurked in the depths of the tunnel made Lumian, despite his feigned high level, intuitively uneasy. He believed it represented an almost certain death sentence. Yet, Mad Lady persisted in her attempt to approach. Could there be a reason compelling her to make contact with that object? Lumian wondered. He suspected that Mad Lady's actions might be part of the Celestial Worthy's scheme, convincing her that she could confront the provocation head-on and escape in time. I can't let her and that celestial worthy succeed. Besides, personally, I look forward to ending her myself rather than witnessing her being swallowed by that dangerous object. Lumian's eyes narrowed, the desire to teleport forward and intercept Mad Lady compelling him. However, preventing a traveler from reaching a specific location in such a manner was clearly impossible. Lumian hesitated, unwilling to genuinely approach the flesh and blood bird's nest deep within the tunnel. Suddenly, an idea struck him. The peculiar structure's rejection of outsiders seems to have lifted, and with Lotto Gyro, a person possessing a potent sea bloodline deceased, could I attempt to gain temporary authority as the governor of the sea to halt Mad Lady's progress? With that in mind, Lumian embarked on his endeavor. Activating the power of the sea within him, he allowed his astral projection to merge and swiftly expand outward. Chapter 589, Object Within the Nest As Lumian's astral projection expanded with the power of the sea, he immediately sensed the presence of the waters. This wasn't a genuine ocean, but a fantastical sea created by radiant starlight. At its core lay the projection of the silver-gray behemoth. Empowered by an ample supply of the sea's power, Lumian's astral projection surged forward, merging seamlessly with the phantom. A burning sensation radiated from the left side of his chest, as if some form of acknowledgement had been received. His consciousness extended boundlessly, taking command of the dreamlike illusory sea. In the course of this process, he glimpsed the phantoms of Juan Oro, Ultraman Lotto Gyro, and unfamiliar apparitions. Those who have returned to the sea, they seem to have transformed into water droplets in the sea. Lumian withdrew his gaze from the joyful Juan Oro and the pained Lado Gyro, redirecting it toward the depths of the tunnel ahead. From a considerable distance, he spotted Mad Lady. The silver-gray behemoth harbored entities nurtured within the flesh and blood bird's nest. 
With the baitings, black insect, little devils, and other extraterrestrial life forms, it was inevitable that they coexisted in the spirit world. However, this spirit world was entirely severed from the external realm. Consequently, Beyonders skilled in summoning creatures from the spirit world for assistance found themselves bereft of their primary reliance. Teleportation executed through the spirit world, however, retained some semblance of normalcy. Departing directly, however, proved impossible. The only avenues were through the energy passageway at the entrance or by breaching the outer wall to connect the inner and outer spirit worlds. Simultaneously, the closer one approached the flesh and blood bird's nest, the more peculiar the spirit world became. It was as though the air gradually thickened, becoming almost tangible and impeding the approach of birds. In such an environment, Coupled with the absence of a flesh and blood bird's nest, Mad Lady found herself unable to teleport directly. Her only recourse was to blink incrementally, expending her spirituality with each maneuver. Having focused on Mad Lady and the space in front of her, Lumian suddenly extended his right hand and clenched it into a fist. The air surrounding Mad Lady immediately grew dense, as if assuming a tangible form. This transformation caused the illusory curtain to bend, compressing the corresponding area into a dark and transparent sphere. Once more, Mad Lady's form disappeared, but a formless force, shaped by the bending area, yanked her out and sent her plummeting. Under the authority of the Governor of the Sea, the spirit world within the sphere and the spirit world within the silver-gray behemoth were forcibly separated. However, this effect was contingent on the peculiar environment. In the external world, given Lumian's current level and mastery of the power of the sea, completely isolating an area from the expansive and genuine spirit world proved challenging. He could merely employ cosmic void to create an exit path and a door symbolizing an escape route, a tactic vulnerable to counteraction by a traveler's abilities. Mad Lady attempted another blink, yet found herself unable to escape the dark sphere's confines. She halted in place, seriously contemplating her recorded abilities and the items in her possession that might alleviate her current predicament. Observing her struggle, Lumian couldn't suppress his yearning for demigod. Level powers. As the temporary authority-wielding governor of the sea essentially a faux demigod incapable of withstanding a single spell from the Cinderella demigod Lumian had ensnared Mad Lady in an inescapable dilemma. She proved challenging even for Mr. Kena K to subdue in a brief time frame. Mad Lady gazed into the depths of the metal tunnel, representing the flesh and blood bird's nest, her face aglow with unrestrained eagerness, anticipation, and excitement. Confined within the dark sphere, she yearned for escape, dissatisfied with her inability to reach the desired destination. Head over there, quick! Head over there, quick! I want to go over! The longing in her heart intensified, nearly manifesting as a tangible desire. The desire surged into her chest, seeking to rupture the restraints and liberate her from this predicament. Mr. Kanake, having switched to a traveler's soul, swiftly caught up and saw Mad Lady. Instinctively, an illusory book materialized in his dark eyes. Positioned in front of Mr. K, the book flipped through its pages while chanting in a low voice, I came, I saw, I record. In an instant, Mr. Kanake underwent a transformation, manifesting as a two to three meter tall half-giant donned in cold black armor, brandishing a dark, straight broadsword. Having grazed a traveler, he had selected three Bayonder powers, Blink, Record, and the Traveler's Door, encompassing teleportation or travel. Additionally, with record, he had acquired an ability capable of influencing godhood from a saint of the Aurora Order. While only half as effective as the original, it proved sufficient to contend with Mad Lady, who had yet to approach the threshold of godhood. Mr. K advanced confidently, wielding the dark, straight broadsword, prepared to strike. At that moment, Mad Lady's chest was overwhelmed by an intense surge of desire. Then she experienced a sharp, piercing pain. She didn't need to lower her head. From the corner of her eye, she witnessed the flesh on her chest tearing apart inch by inch, the white bones snapping one by one. A grayish-white fog, mingled with fragments of flesh, surged forth, coalescing into a humanoid figure resembling her. 
In an instant, it leaped out of the dark sphere created by Lumion and darted into the depths of the metal tunnel. Don't be in a hurry to leave. Unfazed by the situation, Mad Lady's face reflected excitement and a hint of regret. PFFT, Mr. K's dark broadsword cleaved through the dark sphere, diagonally bisecting Mad Lady. Wearing the ring imbued with flesh and blood magic, Mad Lady didn't succumb immediately. Her two halves of flesh and blood writhed, attempting to reunite, but all endeavors were obliterated by the profound darkness left in the wake of the broadsword. The flesh and blood failed to re-establish a connection. Come on, come on! Mad Lady's relatively intact head sought to aid her body, but she swiftly perceived the annihilation of her soul. Her vision darkened, and her unevenly separated bodies crumpled to the ground. Unperturbed by the fate of the April Fool's key member, Mr. Kranke and Lumion redirected their focus to the grayish-white figure hurtling into the depths of the metal tunnel. Comprising half fog and half flesh, the figure existed in a realm between reality and illusion. The temporary governor of the sea, Lumion, once again honed in on the target and its surroundings, intending to marshal every ounce of sea power at his disposal. At that moment, the grayish-white figure collapsed to the ground. The flesh and blood originally belonging to Mad Lady seeped into the metal floor, and the grayish-white fog was on the verge of being absorbed. Abruptly, the entire tunnel trembled. Lumion once again saw the pair. Shaped object fashioned from flesh and skin. The flesh membrane on its surface buckled once more, outlining a disc. Shaped contour. A formidable suction force erupted. Whether Lumion, the temporary governor of the sea, or Mr. Kenneth K, they found themselves irresistibly propelled into the depths of the metal tunnel, as if an invisible hand seized them and drew them toward the core of the silver-gray behemoth. Mad Lady's dismembered corpse and her belongings soared into the air, propelled towards the destination she had fervently yearned for in life. The humanoid form outlined by the grayish-white fog seeped deeper into the metal floor, absorbing a portion. In that moment, Lumion, wielding the temporary authority of the governor of the sea, employed his enhanced perception to see the flesh and blood birds nest deep within the metal tunnel more distinctly than before. The pear-shaped object's flesh and skin caved in, and the starlight and dark matter emanating from the surrounding flesh ropes accelerated their flow. Through the taut skin and flesh, Lumion vaguely sensed the object nurtured within the pear-shaped structure. It resembled a pitch-black vortex capable of devouring all colors and light. While not overly large, it featured a disc-shaped outer edge. W.H., Lumion instinctively recalled scientific concepts and simplified scenes his sister Auror had once explained. He identified a term that matched his observations, a black hole. Did the Abraham family's ancestor seal a black hole with Amon? A black hole that has yet to fully form and is still nurtured within a mother's body from a mystical standpoint. Lumion found the idea absurd, straddling the line between scientific and mystical. Simultaneously, he sensed a connection between the black hole-like object and another place. A profound, weighty, dense, and terrifying aura loomed over the world. With a buzzing sensation, Lumion teetered on the brink of losing consciousness. Not only was his physical form being drawn towards the flesh and blood bird's nest, but even his thoughts, spirit body, and destiny converged in that direction. It was the same for Mr. K. One after another, Mad Lady's fragmented remains and a few belongings floated between them. Beyond the silver-gray behemoth, Franca and the others felt an ominous suction emanating from the seabed. It seemed as though a colossal vortex was forming, ready to engulf everything in its vicinity. Splash! The mountainous azure waves and jade-green seawater collapsed, filling the seabed. Abruptly, resplendent starlight descended from the sky. Madam Magician materialized, adorned in a deep black warlock robe embroidered with shimmering silver stars. The wielder of a major arcana card extended her right hand toward the silver-gray behemoth at the seabed. Her figure appeared in a state of overlap, intermittently clear and blurry. Each radiant starlight transformed into an illusory door, seamlessly melding with the suction force merging into the silver-gray behemoth. 
Chapter 590, The Truth Behind the Seal The surface of the massive silver-gray behemoth ignited with illusory doors, casting a star-like brilliance that darkened the sky above the sea. This existing seal, triggered by Madame Magician, no longer resided in a nadir due to celestial shifts. Starlight descended, swiftly repairing the temporary damage inflicted upon the seal. Inside the behemoth, half of the grayish-white fog composing Mad Lady's human form was absorbed by the metal floor, appearing as if it would sink further. In that crucial moment, starlight permeated the walls, floor, and ceiling, materializing resplendent doors of various shapes. These doors manipulated the void, thwarting the menacing suction and expelling the grayish-white fog. Abruptly, Lumion felt the formidable suction force from the metal tunnel's depths dissipate. He saw the dented flesh and blood bird's nest expanding again, releasing a copious amount of resplendent starlight. The torrent surged through different parts of the silver-gray behemoth like a flood breaching a dam. Lumion, Mr. K, Mad Lady's remains, and the items undulated with the sea's waves. As they were propelled forward, they encountered resistance and erosion from the sea's power. Meanwhile, the fleshless, corporeal grayish-white phantom swayed in the vast starlight, growing fainter before gradually dissipating. Unlike previous instances, the sea's power did not erupt from the ocean depths this time. Madame Magician had severed the energy passageway, successfully resealing and reinforcing the seal. Madame Magician, her form seemingly illusory, raised her right hand and pointed at the betrothal ship and sailboat, her eyes mirroring the corresponding scene. The two ships, along with Hela Franca, the Cinderella demigod, the humanoid sealed artifact, the maidens of the sea, the remaining deputy hosts, and the sailors, vanished from the underwater cavity, instantly reappearing on the sunny, calm, turquoise sea beyond the seal. Crash! Mountain-like azure waves and jade-green seawater resembling well walls slammed down, filling the underwater cavity. Madame Magician's gaze then shifted to Lumion, Mr. K, Mad Lady's corpse, pride armor, and other items. Just as she was about to relocate them, Lumion, still donning the flog boxing gloves, suddenly felt a heavy, dense, terrifying, and brilliant aura looking at him from another place connected to the black hole in the flesh and blood bird's nest. Crack, crack. Lumion heard his bones shattering, his skull caving in, ribs snapping and flesh compressing layer by layer. After unleashing the ascetic's accumulated strength, he, now taller, was instantly compressed into a short, thin, and dense form. Intense pain flooded his mind, and his brain began to passively contract. After a moment, Lumion broke free from the gaze and floated into the gradually calming air. Before Madame Magician, an illusory book rapidly flipped, emitting a faint glow full of vitality. It bathed Lumion's body in light, reconstructing his broken bones and swiftly enlarging his compressed flesh, rescuing him from his near-death state. Then, Madame Magician tossed Mad Lady's rose-gold ring embedded with the crimson gem to Lumion, allowing him to reassemble his flesh and blood and return to his original appearance. He was no longer a short, thin, and heavy peculiar human. Simultaneously, in Port Santa, Loki's figure faded as he entered the spirit world, preparing to teleport away. However, a dark, formless barrier appeared in front of him, blocking his path. Loki's pupils dilated as he realized that at some point, he had been ensnared in a dark and transparent sphere, seemingly bent from the void, with walls everywhere and a hidden door. High up in the spirit world, near the seven pure lights Madame Magician hovered, adorned in a deep black warlock robe adorned with stars. Loki's presence registered in her eyes, and an illusory book rapidly flipped before her. She had strategically waited until the last moment to prevent Loki from receiving the Celestial Worthy's warning, providing her an opportunity to capture him alive. Loki's lips curled into an exaggerated smile upon understanding the situation. Rumble. His body erupted from the inside out, as if a self-controlled bomb had been embedded in his flesh beforehand. Loki's bizarre suicide succeeded. Flesh and blood splattered, and his aura dissipated. Madame Magician promptly lifted the seal on the area, 
capturing the information Loki had imprinted in the spirit world. The spirit world served as a repository for all information. Divination often entailed revelations from the spirit world, and the matter of resurrection inevitably left corresponding information. As long as she found relevant information in time, Madame Magician could trace Loki to his resurrection spot and pinpoint the ancient castle documented in the Secret Order records. Soon, Madame Magician obtained something. Her figure vanished from the spirit world's heights, navigating the endless darkness adorned with symbols. In the next moment, a vast grayish-white fog materialized before her eyes. Magician halted, gazing at the seemingly endless expanse of grayish-white fog, under the silent, dusky sky, above the calm blue sea. Using Mad Lady's ring embedded with a crimson gem, Lumion adjusted his internal organs, flesh, and bones to their original state. Treading on the corporeal wind, Lumion removed the ring that enabled the use of flesh and blood magic and anxiously inquired of Madame Magician, how's the situation on the other two fronts? As he spoke, he sensed a mystical and indiscernible flicker from Madame Magician. Magician smiled. Loki has just been killed by me, but I couldn't prevent his resurrection or seize the opportunity to locate his ancient castle. Bard has been captured by Gandalf, whom you intentionally sent to Milo village. He's alive. Phew, Lumion instinctively heaved a sigh of relief. Though he hadn't captured Loki, wasting one more of Loki's resurrections meant he had achieved his objectives. Furthermore, Ultraman and Mad Lady had been completely eliminated and Bard had been captured alive. The results were satisfactory. Initially, Lumion hadn't confirmed Bard's identity. He didn't even know if Bard had participated in the Sea Prayer ritual. However, he had a few suspects, including the fake governor of the sea and Juan Oro's grandson Fernandez. Since most of the suspects were in Milo village, he had Gandalf closely monitor them. Madame Magician continued, I relocated everyone else from these waters. I sent Mr. K of the Aurora Order back to his rented room in Port Santa. Mad Lady's corpse and items are floating here. The Major Arcana card holder opened her palm, shrouded in darkness, forming a small box. Inside, Mad Lady's dismembered corpse and other items had shrunk to the size of mosquitoes, drifting as if in another world. Lumion was taken aback. He looked at the bottom of the Azure Sea and asked, Is it over? He had anticipated gaining control over the silver-gray behemoth eventually. Otherwise, back then, even two kings of angels couldn't clean up the mess. How is our tarot club going to handle it unless Mr. Fool awakens? Madame Magician replied in an amused tone. Lumion recollected the items in the flesh and blood bird's nest and nodded in agreement. He asked in confusion, Is it true that sealed at the bottom is a black hole? Uh, do you know what a black hole is? I do, Madame Magician chuckled, and I also know that the silver-gray thing down there is a spaceship. Spaceship, Lumion was taken aback. Upon reflection, he realized that the silver-gray behemoth bore a striking resemblance to the spaceship described in his sister's bedtime stories. Madame Magician not only knew about spaceships, but also grasped the concept of a black hole. Never underestimate high-ranking individuals. The time-transcending knowledge possessed by transmigrators might not be foreign to them. Lumian sighed with emotion. At that moment, he noticed that Madame Magician's mystical flickering had vanished. The Major Arcana card holder gazed at the seabed and explained, It's a black hole ready to form, personally created by an evil god. Constantly absorbing surrounding matter and energy, it strengthens itself, eventually becoming a true black hole. In the fourth epoch, the evil god seized an opportunity to send the embryonic black hole through the spaceship at the bottom of the sea. The plan was for it to rapidly develop, tear apart, and devour our planet, causing the barrier to lose support and disintegrate prematurely. True gods and angels could escape, but without the barrier's protection, who knows what would happen. Fortunately, Mr. Dor and Ammon discovered the threat in time and took action. Yet, they couldn't obliterate the already developing black hole. Any attempts to destroy or destabilize, it would only make it stronger. 
the only viable solution was to seal it and patiently wait for it to weaken through repeated radiations until it ultimately evaporates. Alternatively, they could transport it and the spaceship into the cosmos, abandoning it in desolate areas. However, this would require Mr. Seidador to leave the safety of the barrier and shadow the threat continuously to prevent accidents. Moreover, it remained under the vigilant gaze of that entity, which periodically replenished its energy through their connection. The danger was evident. That explains it. Lumian finally grasped why it had been sealed rather than destroyed. Intrigued, he echoed a term, Mr. Door. It bore a striking resemblance to Mr. Fool. 